Namaskar and welcome to Indian Diplomacy, show on uh, Doordarshan, India's national television channel about uh, Indian foreign policy, India's international relations, India's engagement with key strategic partners around the world and how India is helping to shape a better world order. Viewers, uh, in this episode, we are taking up uh, India's relationship with a very important special strategic partner, South Korea, and South Korea's evolution as an Indo-Pacific power. And to discuss the importance of South Korea for the Indo-Pacific region and especially uh, from a bilateral and regional point of view with India, I have a very distinguished scholar joining me from Kongju National University in South Korea, Dr. In Jong Lim. Hello, thank you for having me. Professor Lim, thank you so much for joining uh, Indian Diplomacy. It's an honor to have you. Uh, to begin with, uh, South Korea has come up with a new Indo-Pacific policy. And uh, this has caught a lot of attention in India uh, because in the past, uh, it used to be thought uh, that South Korea is uh, a weak link in the Indo-Pacific strategy of the US alliance system. But uh, now South Korea has its own strategy and uh, it matches the strategies of many other countries, including uh, India's own vision for uh, a free and open Indo-Pacific. So uh, I'd like you to start by uh, telling our audiences why South Korea has come up with its own Indo-Pacific uh, strategy and uh, what is the thinking and what kind of uh, regional uh, and global factors uh, have played into the shaping of South Korea's Indo-Pacific policy. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for uh, raising a very important question. Um, yes, um, we have been uh, very much pragmatic, I will say, uh, because, you know, Korea, um, of course, you know, its size, geographic size, physical size is not that big, mm. but we do have a pretty decent number of population, and based on the manufacturing and free uh, trade, this country has um, developed, and then uh, we accumulated our wealth which means um, the best condition, best environment for the South Korea-like um, merchant and a trader country. Again, the superpower, their relationship should be friendly too. Mm. Otherwise, um, we cannot, our choice and our diplomatic choices will be uh, pretty much narrowed because as we all know, uh, South Korea still faces furious challenges uh, from the North Korea. So as long as you know we have this very uh, deep um, conventional um, security threat from the other side of the peninsula, uh, we definitely need to prioritize our security. Even though we want to be more pragmatic uh, with more superpower, but still again, um, this conventional uh, traditional security reason is still there. And in addition to that, U.S.-China, again, their strategic competition has been increasing and increasingly serious, mm. especially in the field of new technology. And having had that structure changing, um, in addition to that, again, the Russia invaded Ukraine last year, and we all realized that this kind of thing can happen even in the middle of 21st century. Yeah, and, and Professor Lim, you mentioned North Korea, and um, obviously that is an overwhelming threat uh, that South Korea faces and for various historical and emotional reasons. Uh, but um, the broader region, you know, the Indo-Pacific strategy of South Korea is not just limited to the Northern Pacific. Uh, it talks about uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, um, you know, Pacific Island states, so there seems to be a broadening of the strategic uh, focus of South Korea beyond just North Korea, isn't it? And earlier administration of uh, Pre President uh, Moon Jae-in had something called the new Southern policy. And now we have this uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. So is South Korea looking to play a bigger role um, uh, in the broader Indo-Pacific? And if so, is it moving out of the uh, you know US shadow and trying to play a more independent or a you know, more forceful role in the region, you think? <laughs> well, um, again, as you highlighted, uh, our previous government, the Moon Jae-in government, they also suggested, uh, um, you know, new southern policy, and uh, they also uh, prioritized the relationship with the ASEAN countries or Southeast Asian countries like uh, India. 
I think this is a very um, natural evolution. Mm. Again, um, as a merchant and as a trader, um, South Korea has been always looking for good, friendly market and, you know, the place we want to invest more. Mm. Um, so in that sense, again, of course, you know, China, the economic rise of China has been a uh, fortune to the Korea's um, economic wealth. Definitely having had the rise of China, I think uh, South Korea um, could uh, be able to, again, uh, develop further. So mm. now, you know, South Korea is one of the top 10 richest countries in the world. But um, again, we still want to maintain a good relationship with the China, uh, but gradually, um, the market uh, or the um, how how they conducted their policy um, has been gradually more and more risky uh, to the uh, uh, Korean industry, and of course, you know the environment, international environment, changed a lot too. Mm. So having said that, definitely ASEAN and India-like countries. This is a fascinating. Fascinating market uh, to the uh, uh, Korea, South Korea. Again, the India now is the most, you know, most uh, populous country in the world. You know, it surpassed uh, China's position very recently. Not only that, again, India is the largest democracy in the world, which mm. means you know we can understand better. Again, the, our regimes are much more compatible. And militarily, too, again, the Korea um, is, of course, a part of the Eurasian continent, mm. but we are disconnected um, as long as North Korea is there. <laughs> and as long as we don't have infrastructure connectivity uh, with the uh, Eurasian continent, you know, we are, South Korea is like an island. So it's very natural for us to go out Mm. Um, again, the, through the maritime, um, you know, the, the sea line lane and um, the maritime security, um, those things are naturally important uh, for Korea. Again, our energy, for example, yeah. you know, 90 percent, more than 90 percent uh, of our oil, gas, those things are traveling along the sea lane, which starts from the Parishan Gulf and Malacca Strait, South China Sea, East China Sea. Again, the maritime security is super, super crucially important uh, for this island-like country. So definitely in that sense, you know, um, South Korea, I think it's very natural for South Korea to think about um, bigger role mm. or more, um, you know, uh, more um, those responsibility in the Indo-Pacific region. Right. So South Korea is looking to take greater responsibility in the Indo-Pacific, uh, says Professor Injun Lim. Uh, viewers, um, apart from the Indo-Pacific policy, there's also the U.S. alliance. And uh, on that uh, front, South Korea has been strengthening uh, the uh, U.S. alliance and also uh, patching up with Japan. And these are big developments. And I'd like you to mm -hmm. hear a very important um, uh, set of reports, uh, watch these reports on the uh, coming together of uh, the old allies, U.S., Japan, and South Korea. And uh, let's hear this and uh, continue the discussion. Sure. The United States held joint air exercises bilaterally with South Korea and Japan involving strategic bombers on Sunday. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said the exercise demonstrated the allies' overwhelming defense capabilities and readiness posture. The South's military said in a statement, that the exercise, quote, affirmed the United States' ironclad commitment to the defense of the Korean Peninsula. In a separate exercise, Japan flew F-15s over the Sea of Japan with U.S. bombers, Japan's defense ministry said in a statement, calling the security environment, quote, increasingly severe. Leaders of Japan and South Korea met on Thursday in a historic moment because it's the first time that a South Korean president has visited Japan in 12 years. The two countries, both allies of the U.S. but with centuries of animosity between them, are increasingly being driven closer together by China's growing presence in world affairs and mutual security threats such as North Korea. Underlining that subject, North Korea launched another long-range ballistic missile that landed in the sea between the three countries just hours before President Yoon Suk-yeol arrived in Japan. 
This video released by Japan's defense ministry is believed to show the missile's contrail. Yoon and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida hashed out several new agreements in the visit, including tightening intelligence sharing and ending an almost four-year dispute over raw materials used in high-tech equipment. The visit also came in the middle of joint military drills between South Korea and American forces. It's not clear if the warmth between the Japanese and South Korean governments will change opinions at home. A recent poll by Gallup Korea shows 64% of respondents there said there was no rush to improve ties with Tokyo without a change in Japan's attitude. So, uh, viewers, you just heard uh, the recent geopolitical developments in uh, East Asia, where Japan, South Korea, and the U.S. are closing ranks and uh, trying to form some kind of a united front. So coming back to you, Professor Lim, um, you already talked about how uh, South Korea's rise has been linked to uh, China's economic uh, you know, linkages and the interdependence with China. But um, there is also this question about the US uh, containment or slash what the Chinese are calling encirclement or suppression strategy of China. And uh, as a US ally, if you are getting closer and deeper into the uh, Japan-US uh, embrace and uh, trying to form, you know, doing more joint military exercises and force posturing and all those things, intelligence sharing. Um, how would you then balance it with the need to continue to have uh, friendly ties with China? The Indo-Pacific strategy of South Korea, unlike the Japanese and the Indian or even the US strategy, uh, does in fact mentions China as a key partner and as a friendly country for peace and stability in Indo-Pacific. So there is some variance, isn't it? And how would you uh, categorize South Korea's approach to uh, China in light of these developments, uh, especially uh, the UN administration, the current administration, South Korea? Uh, the right wing seems to be more uh, inclined to uh, go along with the US. But then how do you then keep the, have the um, American friendship and also eat the Chinese cake? Well, it's really a difficult time for South Korea-like country. Again, when superpowers, they are friendly to each other, that's the best time for a Korea-like country. But as we all know, uh, I don't want to blame just one side, but you know, just time goes by and things have changed. And now again, we do see um, strategic competition, almost like a fatal competition between US and China. Um, again, the China's um, role is huge in many ways um, to South Korea, not only just economically. Again, the South China, China is just you know bordering with us. Of course, between between the two countries, we do have sea. But at the same time, you know, China is bordering with the North Korea, um, which means when we try to um, resolve the North Korea related issue without China's um, engagement, it will be almost like an impossible to solve the issue, any issue related to the North Korea. This is the, our reality. In that sense, we don't want to aggravate unnecessarily um, our dear friend, again, the China. But um, as long as this power structuring, uh, power restructuring, I'll say, power restructuring is ongoing, and as long as all, all this, you know, armed races are getting more serious, um, mm. we need to prioritize our security and deterrence capability first. So um, I hope again, even though um, China will be pretty much again stimulated by all this um, kind of unity um, between US, China, Korea, Japan, or even Philippines, or who knows, I mean, if, if we touch on the Taiwan issue, um, if so, China will be again the, pretty much really, uh, really sensitive to anything related to Taiwan as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, this is more like a kind of security dilemma situations uh, for both. Um, but you know, probably uh, for South Korea, uh, the best option is again uh, we need to definitely secure our deterrence capability. And then uh, we uh, want to, and we need to persuade China um, to help us again to solve the uh, North Korean issues. Otherwise, all this yeah. arms race 
will be getting um, more and more serious yeah. or getting into just escalation. Yeah, uh, Professor Lim uh, understood. I mean, South Korea has uh, its compulsions and it needs China. Uh, but um, on the other side, you know, the Yoon administration has been talking about uh, uh, aligning, if not joining, the Quad, which includes mm -hmm. India, Japan, United States, and Australia. There are some working groups uh, under Quad. Um, on vaccines and on uh, technology, critical and mm -hmm. emerging technologies, on climate change and all these things where the UN administration has been indicating, uh, in fact, it has been talking to India and saying that they want India's support to, for South Korea to play a bigger role in the Quad Plus type mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, as you know, Quad, uh, whether uh, they officially say it or not, unofficially, it is a means to push back against uh, what... Uh, we in the Quad members see as a Chinese expansionism and aggression. So, um, mm. how would you characterize South Korea's? I mean, are they have they moved past the ambivalence and the ambiguity? Are they uh, more uh, convinced about the utility of Quad? And uh, can that also help with the deterrence? I mean, I understand you need the U.S. Uh, you know security mm. umbrella. Uh, for deterrence mm -hmm. against North Korea. But then uh, what about the broader role that you are envisaging for South Korea as it be uh, becomes bigger in the region? Can Quad uh, be one means or vehicle through which South Korea can express uh -huh. itself and uh, join into creative partnerships and have bigger influence in the region? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, again, uh, if we recall our memory, uh, when the then candidate uh, Mr. Yoon Sung Yeol was elected, again he uh, made a phone call. Of course, the number one phone call went to the U.S., uh, but and then the second one went to um, went to Japan, and then um, and then the United Kingdom, and then Australia, and then the fifth was to to India. Yeah. Um, so except the uh, uh, the U.K., of course, you know U.K. does have or not a, like a very interesting uh, partnership. Uh, for example, AUKUS was another like a, a, a new, probably new military regime. But anyhow, um, you know, except the United Kingdom, all these four countries are members of Quad, mm -hmm. um, which indicated that the then elected uh, president, to, to current to the president Yoon Sung Yeol, he is um, policy even at the time, uh, looked to prioritize these Quad um, countries, Quad member. Um, of course, you know, Quad um, is domestically uh, in this country um, is more controversial because the other group, the opposition group, will be very much concerned about, you know, retaliation or anxiety, um, unnecessary, right, unnecessary escalation of the tension uh, between the China and the others, or like even over the Korean Peninsula, definitely we don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, but as you just mentioned, you know, Quad is not only for just you know those military things. Again, mm -hmm. it can cover climate change. I think this should be prioritized than many other issues. Uh, because all these Asian countries are very much economically developing, but at the same time, which means we are consuming tremendously, you know, huge amount of energy, which means, again, that we emit huge amount of um, carbon dioxide, all these, you know, air pollutants, yeah. which means we definitely need to think about more sustainable development of the uh, um, Asia. Yes. So definitely climate change issue should be and can be, I think, um, one big agenda uh, among these, you know, quad or quad plus um, um, partnership or like a public health issue, as you just mentioned. Uh, you know, we all realize that as, you know, network, international network is really important to deal with um, this overwhelming challenge like COVID-19 pandemic or new technology too. As I said, um, you know, power restructuring is ongoing yes. and global value chain is now going through the restructuring too. So we need to think about and we need to develop uh, right. more sustainable um, um, network, value chain, a value network right. um, in this region. Yes. So I think there are many, many long list of uh, good agenda. A lot of, um, uh, a, lot of uh, a lot of non-traditional security areas 
where yes. South Korea mm -hmm. could partner uh, with Quad uh, without any qualms, says uh, Professor uh, In Jun Lim. But viewers, um, uh, let's now focus on a little more on the South Korea-India um, special sure. strategic partnership. Uh, I have a, a video statement from uh, Dr. Uh, Tithli Basu. She is an associate professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University and a specialist on East Asian uh, studies. Let's hear her about the pos potential areas where South Korea and India can cooperate. Let's hear her and then come back to the discussion. Sure. You know, there is a lot of opportunity for cooperation within India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, uh, which uh, we announced, uh, Prime Minister Modi announced um, in the East Asia Summit way back in 2019 and the Seven Pillars. So I think one uh, uh, vertical on which we need to deepen the cooperation is the maritime domain awareness. Uh, we have our information fusion center in the Indian Ocean region and um, uh, it's driven by the uh, idea of or the objective of increasing situational awareness in maritime commons. So India uh, is asking for support uh, from offshore countries and it would be great if South Korea can pitch in. I mean, uh, one uh, small step to start with is sending El Yaso to the fusion center. South Korea is an indispensable player when it comes to a high-tech sector. So. Um Discussion on uh, re-engineering supply chains uh, need to deepen uh, what we can br uh, bring to the table and how we can take it forward is uh, one thing that we really need to invest our uh, diplomatic, political and you know, uh, energy on. India on its own has taken a lead on uh, various uh, global stages, whether it is the International Solar Alliance or Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, uh, creating um, you know, uh, global uh, uh, low-carbon pathways. So this is where uh, Seoul can again pitch in uh, and contribute to uh, global global initiatives. My fourth and final point is about um, building effective communication when it comes to defense industry cooperation. The strengths of South Korean in the defense industry, it has emerged uh, as a prominent player in weapons export and our um, you know, status as a leading importer of arms um, stays. Uh, so kind of, uh, you know, uh, to kind of uh, uh, explore the synergies uh, between uh, the two countries, regular and effective communication at the highest level and thorough understanding of the structures and policies are important. Cooperation and shipbuilding is vitally important. Private sector dialogue, I feel, uh, can facilitate uh, uh, defense exports uh, uh, further. And India is focusing on joint ventures uh, when it comes to, uh, it, it brings more value, uh, whether it is um, uh, transfer of technology or participation in defense exports. I think these uh, things um, uh, you will define the future uh, tone of the relationship between the two countries. So viewers, uh, you heard uh, Dr. Tithli Basu talking about uh, at least four areas where South Korea and India can cooperate. Uh, coming back to uh, Professor Lim, um, the thing is, uh, Professor Lim, there, the South Korea-India bilateral trade has reached all-time high of almost $28 billion. Um, and very interestingly, as Professor Basu was just mentioning in the video, uh, defense exports from South Korea to India are rising. I was just looking up the data. Mm -hmm. After uh, Russia, uh, United States... France and Israel, South Korea has become the fifth largest, you know, defense uh, player in the Indian market. And um, mm -hmm. the Indian army is using the South Korean K-9 uh, artillery gun, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, the Indian Navy is uh, looking to get lots of components that will help uh, build uh, submarines and, um, you know, anti-torpedo warfare and these kinds of things. So very advanced areas uh, where we are talking about defense cooperation. So this is an emerging area uh, where South Korea has come in in last few years. And it's been uh, quite uh, fascinating to see this change. So it's not only the non-traditional areas, but even hard security. India seems to be looking to South Korea for co-production and co-development of advanced uh, weapons. And also, on the other hand, the critical technologies. You know, the, we all know South Korea is a leader in um, semiconductors, you know, your companies uh, mm -hmm. like uh, SK Hynix and uh, Samsung are the, you know, world leaders in semiconductors. And that's another area where India is looking to bring in more foreign investment. So maybe there is uh, potential for uh, India and South Korea to cooperate there also. And these are in many ways very strategic, isn't it? I mean, they are not aimed at a third country. Uh, we are not uh, mm -hmm. trying to do this as a containment effort of anybody, which is uh, which f about which South Korea is uncomfortable, but in effect, they are also strengthening our hard power and our scientific and economic capabilities and increasing our overall power. So in that sense, I think it's a win-win, isn't it? So your thoughts on yeah. what more South Korea and India can do to advance this, uh, you know, positive trend? Uh, this country, South Korea's economy, 
its industry has been developing um, based on the two things. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning, manufacturing and then export. And manufacturing, Korea's manufacturing, has been um, oriented uh, from a, more like a strategic calculation. Otherwise, probably South Korea didn't um, come this way. For example, when again the, we, um, we um, uh, made the Costco like a steel making um, kind of company, again, the problem with the rest of the world was very much doubtful. Again, the South, South Korea back then was not that again the developed enough I mean, to have that kind of you know, heavy industry, but we did. The reason why we did was again that we always concerned about the security reason. Otherwise, probably we just chose to be more cost efficient, but we couldn't be <laughs> like that way as long as again the North Korea is threatening us all the time. So the reason why I mentioned this is again the U.S. Um, I'm sorry, India and Korea. Mm. These two countries are trustable. This is more than more important than anything, I think. As long as we do have a trust between the, again, the Korea and India, we can develop further strategic all these, again, the industries, as you just mentioned, defense industry, semiconductor, definitely chips is almost like a word these days. So chips is definitely um, the area we can work together. Or any other crucial um, new technology related industry, we can work together. Again, yeah. we can and, trust and, each other. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, we, and we have the uh, US initiative for a chip four alliance that includes South right. Korea, Japan, um, uh, and US and Taiwan. Let's see if India could join the Chip4 Alliance, and there are many <laughs> possibilities there. But uh, I want to thank Professor Ying Jung Lim for uh, sharing valuable insights about the South Korea-India relationship and also South Korea's expanding role in the Indo-Pacific. This is very, very Thanks. vital. So viewers, uh, thank you so much for joining um, on the show. Uh, I want to uh, conclude by saying that South Korea is a very important country, and South Korea yes. cannot be underestimated. And we just heard from Professor Ing Jung Lim of Kongju National University about how uh, South Korean technology, know-how, and also intent to become a more proactive player is uh, remaking the world. Thank you, Professor Lim. Thank you so much for being on Indian Diplomacy. Thank you for having me. So viewers, um, that's it uh, for me on this occasion. But do think about uh, middle powers, uh, which are ambitious and which have got a lot of uh, extraordinary economic and technological prowess like South Korea, how they can be valuable to Indian foreign policy. I'll see you again next time. Until then, take care.